character traits or thought patterns that impede or prevent the acquisition of knowledge. These include dogmatism, intellectual dishonesty, and mm. wishful thinking. The most important- Wow. <laughs> that describes a lot of pundits. A lot of them. <laughs> important epistemological vice- that's what, that's what we should say next time. Like, excuse me, sir. You appear to be demonstrating some epistemological vices right now. Yes, you have the sin of dogmatism upon you. What's up, people? Michael here to talk about a fellow bald digital media personality who, unlike yours truly, has inspired the exquisite wrath of epidemiologists and 1970s folk singers alike. That's right, Mr. Joseph James Rogan. Now, we talked about Rogan's penchant for peddling vitamins with sky-high promises in our video about men's wellness, so be sure to check that out. But here's the gist. Rogan was a stand-up comedian, turned sitcom star, turned host of Fear Factor, turned UFC commentator, who made that rare pivot into global celebrity when he started his podcast, The Joe Rogan Experience, in 2009. Very early adopter. bought by Spotify in 2020 for a, technically speaking, ton of money and today it's the most popular pod in the world rogan's devoted fans regularly tune in to consume episodes that often last longer than your average rem cycle but lately rogan's come under fire for spreading misinformation about covid interviewing some pretty sus people and oh, supplying yeah. enough racial slurs for multiple compilation videos in fact it's starting to what about the transphobia philosophy you gotta come on you gotta you gotta pick up on that one feel like the only person more fervent than a Joe Rogan fan. Wise cracks, I'll be Joe very Rogan. I'll be very disappointed if you don't mention it once. Not even once. Rogan hater. So what makes Joe Rogan such a provocative cultural flashpoint? Why does this seemingly normal specimen of a man inspire equally aggressive amounts of love and anger? And ultimately, what does Rogan's prominence say about our society? Let's dig in and find out in this wisecrack edition. What's the deal with Joe Rogan? Now, let's be clear. We've posed a question with no easy answer. Joe Rogan's deal is innately hard to define. That's in large part because there really isn't anyone else doing what he's doing, at least at his level of fame and influence. Sure, he asks people questions under the pretext of gathering information, but he doesn't claim to be a journalist. I guess that's kind of true. If you have 11 million listeners to your podcast on a regular basis, I mean, you're hitting network TV levels of like, and that's, that's like with very little oversight. Think of it. You have the broadcast potential of like a Fox News light. And at the same time, the whole editorial staff is right here. He talks to experts, but has never himself claimed to be an expert on anything, except uh, maybe porn. Oops. Yeah. I'm like, whew. I got oh, it's so cheap system. to maintain. Now I can concentrate on my life, my career. And if I meet somebody, I won't be so needy. And he might perform stand up. But on the show, he doesn't function as a comedian. He's unabashedly in search of genuine discourse about a range of topics. His listeners often say that they see themselves reflected in Rogan. He paints himself as an average dude who just so happens to be able to hold his own in conversation with everyone from comedians to... Just your average, like, quarter billionaire. <laughs> the common folk, you know. <laughs> Astrophysicist. So philosophy and quantum mechanics, they sort of, they, they, they share some sort of a border. Importantly, Rogan's crafted a platform for himself that grants him complete control over his public image. And he seems to use it to intentionally baffle the mainstream media. Because Rogan rarely gives interviews, the only way to understand him is to actually listen to his lengthy podcasts. This gives him a heavily cultivated outsider status. That's even as he makes millions of dollars off one of the biggest media companies in the world and arguably stands as one of the most influential people in America. But if Rogan was just innocuously interviewing tons of people, he probably wouldn't be instigating this level of controversy. Though, of course, some of his guest choices have been questionable. Oh, sweet baby Jesus, we are live, Gavin McGinnis. But where Rogan gets slipperier than a lubed up butter sculpture of a dolphin is in his actual beliefs. He has said, if you say you disagree with me, I probably disagree with me too. I disagree with me all the time. And indeed his worldview is inherently impossible to define or pin down. His opinions are not even internally consistent. Anytime someone levies a critique about his views as expressed in one episode, there seems to always be another episode where he says the opposite. It's a powerful tactic that does not work in other forms of media enterprise. Well, no, because you'd be scrutinized so quickly. <laughs> 
but like, yeah, at the end of the day, he, he's a Rorschach test. He's, he's a blank slate, you know? It's like, what, what are you going to talk to me about today? And we're going to see places where I may agree or disagree. But for the most part, I'm going to give you a platform to just talk about what it is that makes you you. It's, it's, it's very rarely like I'm bringing you on strictly from an adversarial, uh, you know, confrontational perspective. And the one time that really did happen where you could tell the whole thing was set up as like, I'm, I'm going to be battling you on these issues was the Jack Dorsey episode where he's like, oh, hey, Tim Pool, can you can you come on here and, and talk about how this big tech company is censoring the right and is censoring right wing voices because they're putting a rule in that directly protects like gender identity and stuff like that is adding it to their hate speech and their hate clauses and, and talk about that a lot and say that like it's basically demonstrating that Big Ted has a slant towards uh, censoring the right specifically that that was like that was the big one. Oh yes, he will he will push back if you shit talk weed. You do not shit talk weed. Steven Crowder learned that the hard way. That's like the most aggressive Joe Rogan has gone against any single guest. Where he was just like he went after him. He he, he started like UFC broing out in that one. You know he's like you're adorable, you're adorable. Yeah, look how upset you are. And you're like, holy shit, Joe Rogan. He's like, this, this is the most passionate I've seen him about a topic. Ideological consistency is demanded. It'd be like if the New York Times editorial board refuted itself every week. And because any one of his controversial opinions is personally contradicted by him, he can get away with voicing just about any viewpoint he wants. That means he can't really be held accountable the way other public figures actually striving for consistency might be. For example, Rogan might mock mask wearing with comedian Bill Burr. I just love how wearing a mask became like this f***ing, like soft thing that you were doing, like yeah, being courteous, bitches. being courteous. Why is it for b***hs? That, that was so stupid. A mask. But just a few months earlier, he hosted epidemiologist Michael Osterholm, who issued grave warnings about the importance of taking the virus seriously. Well, first of all, you have to understand the timing of it in the sense that it's just beginning. And so in terms of what hurt, pain, suffering, death has happened so far is really just beginning. And then a year later, he gave a platform to cardiologist Peter McCullough, who claimed that the pandemic was planned by universities like Johns Hopkins. And it seemed to be completely organized and intentional in order to create acceptance for, and then promote mass vaccination. Oh, consistency, where art thou? Anyway, by establishing himself as an open-minded goofball who just likes to chat with smart people, Rogan creates a unique a rap. liminal zone in which he and his audience can just ask questions, even if those questions are being posed to and by some controversial folks. Across the political spectrum, Rogan Bilal. Quick pitch for crypto bros betting on ratios. Kinky Dora, holy shit. Do not give them that. I, that is, oh, that's totally going to be a thing. Ratio betting. <laughs> no, it's too, it's too manipulative. Like you can, there's, there's, there, you could buy bot farms. And because of that, it's not something you could gamble on. Like sports, you could make an argument that like, there's a lot of things that go into it that could influence it one way or never true. But at the end of the day, the outcome can still, relatively speaking, not be 100% certain. So if, if it's something on the internet, that you could effectively cheat on pretty easily too I, I could see that becoming a thing the whole shit is manipulative i mean hey i i would bet on keffels i'll say this i would definitely bet on keffels as comparison with conservatives like ben shapiro or alex jones liberals like the pod save america guys or leftists like streamer hassan piker the agenda being relayed is always pretty explicit in contrast hmm it's a lot of a lot of names up on there Everyone from Alex Jones to Hassan. Rogan has cultivated a platform of loyal followers who intrinsically believe in and trust him, despite not fully knowing what his beliefs are. Perhaps the closest thing we have today to what Rogan does is something like The View, where a group of women sit around and chat about a broad range of topics they lack expertise on, but have strong feelings about. Like Rogan, they'll bring in experts to learn from, to lend credibility, and to hopefully offer the audience some intellectual value. But because there isn't really a the view for men. Yeah, but I mean, like when you're, when you're like, if you're not consistent, if you're not actually learning anything, like I always say the two best episodes of Joe Rogan for me are Bernie Sanders and Cornell West, because it really seems like he sits and listens. And both of those people are very good communicators in their various like fields for leftism, socialism, stuff like that. It makes them seem a lot more uh, a lot less frightening a lot more palatable and he genuinely walks away from those both those conversations kind of like okay all right and you're like okay neat right like uh, look, look what happened there uh 
and then we'll bring on someone else who, who's going to say the exact opposite, like a Charlie Kirk or a Ben Shapiro or Jordan Peterson or Jordan Peterson or Jordan Peterson again. I need to talk to you about how Antifa is the God and Lord Serpent Mother. I'm like, Jesus, scurvy man. Many fans see Rogan as providing a masculine coded space that doesn't exist elsewhere. Furthermore, Rogan doesn't talk down to his audience, and that's a big deal. Because a lot of Rogan fans see mainstream media as being pretty judgy towards non-mainstream opinions. But Rogan harbors no judgment towards his guests or his audience. Hell, he's got no judgment for anyone. Come as you are. In Rogan's universe, everybody with an opinion is cool. From Bernie Sanders to a proud boy. The only real sin is not listening to each other. And that's what makes Rogan so compelling. His listeners don't feel like they're being told what to think. They see Rogan fostering open dialogue across the ideological spectrum, and then having enough faith in his audience to draw their own conclusions. Taking at face value, that sounds great. If we buy the curated image that Rogan has crafted of himself and his podcast, it actually sounds pretty benign. Now, importantly, because of Rogan's intellectual flexibility and willingness to talk to anyone, many of his listeners describe him as an outside disruptor speaking truth to power and countering mainstream narratives. Now, this characterization, though, ignores an important reality. These days, Joe Rogan is as mainstream as it gets. Indeed, each week his podcasts get more listeners than any single evening of programming on a major news network. Even as he pitches himself as an outsider, it's hard to not call him mainstream. This apparent contradiction was explained by the New York Times podcast, The Daily, which posits that there are really two mainstream medias at play here. There's what hmm. they call the corporate legacy mainstream, that is huge newspapers like the New York Times or a television news network. And these organizations are supposedly held to certain journalistic standards and practices, like fact checking, source vetting, and not spreading misinformation. In practice, this doesn't always go perfectly, but the ideals still stand. Reporters, editors, legal teams, and fact checkers all collaborate to ensure their content is responsible and unimpeachable. They are machines with lots of moving parts and a lot of money. This is the establishment mainstream. And then there's Rogan's mainstream, a sort of wild west where the rules of journalism no longer apply. While a skilled interviewer, Rogan's not beholden to he those is. same standards of research, sourcing, fact checking, and so he's, he's a good conversationalist. I mean, you can't. Uh, have uh, an intellectually honest conversation about Joe Rogan and not say that there is an appeal to the way that he can direct and, and steer conversations into strange places. There are the memes, obviously. It's usually only a matter of time before he'll bring up weed or he'll bring up DMT or he'll bring up, do you, do you lift, bro? Or, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I find lately, because we hate watch him a bit, uh, he's kind of fallen off uh, a slight amount. Like he's he he's appearing sometimes a little too drunk or a little too high, where he's not able to quite steer it into the interesting places that he used to. Um, but at the same time, like that's of the many things, that's probably why Joe Rogan's appeal became so broad. You know, because I mean, it's it seems very simple when he does it, but in, to stay there with someone for four or five hours and keep things interesting by always pivoting and turning things into to different avenues, right? How did Fear Factor lead to this? I don't know. Be better question is how did News Radio lead to this? You know? News Radio was just, it was an absolute treasure. His podcast is informal. It allows a wide range of viewpoints without concern for whether or not those views are properly backed up by standards like peer review. As a result, he's seen as being anti-establishment and allowing those not typically given a platform to speak. So Rogan's not journalism, but he's also not explicitly trying to entertain in the no, usual he's, sense he's an of the word. He's an opinion sure, piece. he'll have funny comedians and actual conspiracy theorists on his show, but he'll also invite highbrow intellectuals. In a world where the line between entertainment and journalism has become increasingly blurry, Rogan collapses that dichotomy entirely. And while his... Well, yeah, but he also has overwhelmingly right-wing guests. You gotta, you gotta like look at the numbers. We crunch them. I, I, I can show it to you in, in a video essay. I, I have the math, the data, the raw data. Fans may see themselves as pushing back against the corporate legacy mainstream. They are very much a part of Rogan's mainstream, complete with a huge voice and a huge platform. This is no counterculture, but his mainstream is undoubtedly pushing back against gatekeeping. And the experts and intellectuals that modern journalism relies on are often considered to be doing just that. To understand Rogan's appeal as the self-defined common man of the media, we have to understand anti-intellectualism as a force in America. 
Now, there's been a long-standing tension in America between the so-called elite intelligentsia and the average Joe. While our earliest leaders were undoubtedly the headiest of intellectuals, men of the mind were met with suspicion and slave owners. as early as Thomas Jefferson's presidential run in 1796. And in the early 19th century, as the ideals of populist democracy came to the forefront of the American consciousness, the goal was to eliminate status differences in public life. According to historian Richard Hofstadter, the leagues of common men wanted to get along with as little leadership as possible from the educated and propertied class. In a country where most people didn't even have an elementary education, where could these common folks look for guidance if not to learned scholars? Rather than, say, pushing to expand the realm of higher education to make it accessible to the everyman, something else happened. As Hofstadter explains, as popular democracy gained strength and confidence, it reinforced the widespread belief in the superiority of inborn intuitive folkish wisdom over the cultivated over-sophisticated and self-interested knowledge of the literati and the well-to-do. That is to say, the ethos of 19th century America was to trust your gut, not a book. We see touches of this mindset in some of Rogan's logic-driven but ultimately disreputable pontificating today. For example, Rogan once said something about COVID vaccines that might first strike you as relatively intuitive. But if you're like 21 years old and you say to me, should I get vaccinated? I, I go, no. Yeah. Are you healthy? Are you a healthy person? Like, look, don't I guess I guess I, I just roll around in too many uh, lefty science based circles or something, because I, I definitely when I heard this for the first time, I was like, wait, what? What? No, Rogan, don't say that do anything stupid but you should take care of yourself you yeah. should if you're if you're a healthy person and you're exercising all the time and you're young and you're eating well and like i don't think you need to worry about this of course within the epidemiological community there's near unanimous agreement that young healthy people absolutely should be vaccinated because the issue is more complicated than rogan's common sense that speaks to an inconvenient reality about our world the venn diagram of intuition and fact does not always overlap. Anyway, Rogan addressed the backlash by essentially abdicating intellectual responsibility. But back to history. Anti-intellectualism in America was really off to the races with the rise of Jacksonian democracy around 1822. Andrew Jackson's administration distrusted expertise in intellectual and basically kickstarted their expulsion from political life for decades. Now, as author Tom Nichols points out in his book, The Death of Expertise, societies tend to thrive when people don't have to rely on their own expertise in every single arena of life. Back when everybody had to be able to hunt their own food and build their own homes and make their own clothes and bind their own wounds, workmanship was a lot shoddier. Not having enough time to devote to knowing one thing or a small number of things made our ancestors jacks of all trades and masters of none. But for a lot of American history, this kind of self-reliance by the uneducated common man was extolled as virtuous. At the same time, because most professions back then required little to no formal education, intellectualism was seen more as a luxury than as a necessity. The growing world of business also emphasized intuition versus over-intellectualizing. Again, not unlike Joe Rogan. But as the world became in My biggest criticism, by the way, of uh, wisecracks on a regular basis is they usually don't ever do uh, like uh, criticisms of capitalism or you know, like in integrate that into their analysis. They're a lot more philosophy based than anything else. Just not the, the philosophy of Marxism increasingly complicated via the Industrial Revolution, it also became increasingly difficult to be functionally self-reliant. Experts with specific knowledge were brought back into the fold of political life in the Progressive Era at the end of the 19th century, where they would basically maintain sway throughout the New Deal era. Back then, their priorities pretty much aligned with those of the aggrieved common man, who had seen their country hijacked by the likes of Gilded Age robber barons. But what really changed everything, according to Hofstadter, was the rise of anti-communist sentiment in America. See, a fair amount of public intellectuals had communist sympathies. And due to anxieties that climaxed during the Red Scare of the 1950s, these experts in everything from social sciences to chemistry to screenwriting were systematically purged from public life. Across the board, intellectuals were met with a suspicion and hostility that, as Hofstadter noted in 1963, was still alive and well. But ironically, at the same time as hostility,
hostility towards intellectuals was resurging, America began needing experts more than ever. As Hofstadter explained of early 1960s America, society has grown greatly in complexity and in involvement with the rest of the world. In most areas of life, formal training has become a prerequisite to success. At the same time, the complexity of modern life has steadily whittled away the functions the ordinary citizen can intelligently and comprehendingly perform for himself. This only intensified as America became increasingly oriented towards knowledge work. In the complicated post-industrial revolution world, we can't all know everything. So we rely on experts, an architect to design the building, an electrician to wire it, a plumber to make the toilet work, etc. In situations like this, we understand that someone who has been trained and certified and worked at it for years is probably the person you want. Even if, like me, you thought you could fix your toilet and then ended up having to number two at a coffee shop for a week. But as Nichols notes, this isn't the case when it comes to more heady, less hands-on work. Americans, he writes, tend to really chafe at the idea that we're not all equally as smart and capable as the next guy, especially if we still suspect that guy might have communist sympathies. So even as American resentment towards intellectuals grew, we became increasingly reliant on them in every facet of life thus further augmenting that resentment. Nichols argues that this hostility has continued into the present day, and we think that's part of why Rogan is so appealing. He's not an expert and doesn't try to be. He embodies an overarching ethos that, as Hofstadter puts it, the plain sense of the common man is an altogether adequate substitute for, if not actually much superior to, formal knowledge and expertise. And this is an ethos that has dominated American society for much of its history. Now, there's a real psychological reason why trusting experts can feel disempowering, especially as we've entered the knowledge era, where hugely complex endeavors like sequencing the human genome or coding self-driving cars have been accomplished. It's easy to feel like we know nothing, and that's not a fun feeling. As Nichols writes, the fact of the matter is that we cannot function without admitting the limits of our knowledge and trusting in the expertise no, of others. I know we everything. sometimes resist this conclusion and everyone must know this. Our sense of independence this is the truth. This natural human reaction among individuals is dangerous. That's why I'm known as Mega Brain. Characteristic among entire societies. In other words, it's fair to hate being wrong about stuff. The problem is when this becomes a larger societal mindset. Because what happens if nobody's willing to be wrong? If every opinion holds equal weight, regardless of its grounding in facts or reality? When this becomes a society's guiding ethos, we run the risk of dismantling the very foundations of knowledge that enable progress. As Nichols notes, today, the issue is not indifference to established knowledge. It's the emergence of a positive hostility to such knowledge. It is a new declaration of independence. No longer do we hold these truths to be self-evident. We hold all truths to be self-evident, even the ones that aren't true. And that's where we run into trouble with Joe Rogan. Sure, the guy consults plenty of reputable experts, but he also consults people who have been ostracized by the scientific community for spreading misinformation and extolling science that hasn't been replicated or peer-reviewed. He also regularly asks people their opinion on topics on which they are not experts and probably haven't formed opinions with the same rigor as someone with, say, a graduate degree. So what happens when this potpourri of voices is heard on the same platform? the message becomes implicit. All of these truths are equally valid. When you have folks urging people to get vaccines and some urging you not to, the collapse of reliable truths becomes truly dangerous. Sure, you might choose to take the expert certified opinion that vaccines save lives to heart, or you might vibe more with Rogan's implicit logic that vaccines- Or you might promote ivermectin all the time. Oh, wait, I can't say that word anymore, right? It has to be like happy horse goo, because otherwise YouTube will demonetize your videos. But like fucking, uh, did you see the new study that just came out today showing that ivermectin uh, once again has been proven to be ineffective at treating COVID-19 or preventing COVID-19? The same thing that the vast majority of people who are in analyzing this have been saying for a very long time. None of these fools have walked it back. None of them have been like, I was completely wrong about the horse goo. I shouldn't have said that, you know. All they've been is like, CNN lied and said I was taking horse paste when I wasn't taking horse paste. It was horse paste for humans. And it's like this huge big dig. It's like, can you also mention now that it turns out that horse paste doesn't actually do 
do anything and that a lot of people who ended up taking the literal horse pace you know the one for horses because they listen to your show because you reach millions of people like 11 million people because of that now they've all got to like deal with this all the poison controls that happen people are fucking desperate because they want to, to have any kind of medication that helps them in america especially if they don't have health care like fuck joe now's your opportunity horse goo recant recant say nay are an unnecessary apple flavored how bad could it be or yeah you may favor the doctor it's like who's diarrhea hallucinations <laughs> leave him standing alone in the medical community but when all opinions are given equal weight choosing who to believe becomes a trickier prospect and this is actually made all the more complicated by rogan's personal affect he has an almost childlike sense of credulity often acting as impressed surprised or delighted by someone's opinion and sure Rogan might push back on some of his most inflammatory guests, though he does give them plenty of time to share their opinion. But overall, he's more in- But no, no, boo, boo. Philosophy of Joe Rogan, wisecracks, shame on you, okay? One of his biggest problems is he platforms the worst transphobic assholes in the intellectual dark web, gives them all a megaphone, a massive megaphone to spread hate, to spread hate, pseudoscience, misinformation. Like that, that's just handing someone who is openly going to lie that and, and spread lies that endanger trans kids uh, and give them the ability to speak to millions of people, millions of people. Like, and with very little pushback. I'm sorry. Not only is there little pushback, there's usually agreeance when it comes to Joe Rogan. That's another fucked up thing about him. He'll sit there and he'll be like, yeah, yeah, it's true. It's child abuse, you know, giving kids hormone blockers and, and, and you know, uh, giving them bottom surgery and all this kind of stuff. They're abusing children. Like, that's how the radical left and Antifa, they want you to believe that. They, they actually want you to believe that. Anyways, what do you think, Andy? No? What, what do you think about all this? Interested in hearing his guests out, then in the vigorous debate. And this is the root of the problem. To explain, we need to look to epistemology, a branch of philosophy concerned with investigating knowledge and human understanding, or how we know what we know, and specifically the subsection of that branch called virtue epistemology. Virtue epistemologists spend a lot of time thinking about epistemological virtues, i.e. intellectual virtues, or qualities in a person's character or disposition that contribute to their ability to acquire knowledge. These include traits like curiosity, humility, objectivity, and creativity. Epistemological vices, like good as things. scholar Eric Kramer explains, are the opposite character traits or thought patterns that impede or prevent the acquisition of knowledge. These include dogmatism, intellectual dishonesty, and mm. wishful thinking. The most important- Wow. <laughs> that describes a lot of pundits. A lot of them. <laughs> important epistemological vice- that's what, that's what we should say next time. Like, excuse me, sir. You appear to be demonstrating some epistemological vices right now. Yes, you have the sin of dogmatism upon you. For our purposes, is gullibility or credulity. Though the term epistemological vice... You know what's wild is people who, like, who complain about virtue signaling never recognize that they themselves are virtue signaling. They're like, they're actually in the process of virtue signaling. You're virtue signaling about virtue signalers or someone who you believe to be virtue signaling somewhat new, the concept goes way back. In 1661, philosopher Joseph Glanville criticized skepticism and credulity as equal and opposite vices toward the obtaining of knowledge. Of credulity, he described the human tendency to make precipitate, i.e. hasty judgments when we choose to receive all things via permit. Oh, that Keffel's ratio is getting so crunchy. Look at this. 1,148 to 7,568. <laughs> Eat shit, Crowder. <laughs> Excuse admission, which coincidentally was, was written about me in a bathroom stall. In yeah, I saw Basically, it. Basically, while the skeptic might choose not to accept even the most persuasive, well formed argument, the credulous person does the opposite. Credulity implies a lack of discernment, and credulous folks tend to accept knowledge from the latest person they speak to, in spite of qualification or persuasiveness. It's being promiscuous with your brain, which, to be clear, is different than having an emotional affair. Credulity, like other epistemological vices, thus impedes the careful acquisition of knowledge. And that's what we think Joe Rogan's show is probably doing. By presenting a broad range of voices of varying degrees of credibility without rigorous pushback or a journalistic reliance what is on going fact, on? <laughs> the show establishes those views as essentially equally valid. And we'd argue that Rogan's much lauded open-mindedness falls more in the camp of credulity. 
What's more, the way he exhibits this trait I'll agree with this. every guest I'll encourages agree with this the analysis. audience to similarly lack discernment. In a way, Joe Rogan's success in America makes a ton of sense. He's kind of the contemporary embodiment of that old American populist tendency to trust your gut when you hear something that sounds right, rather than listening to the annoying expert who's been studying the topic for years. These days, it's become something of a cliche to say that podcasting comedians like Rogan are the new philosophers. But in Rogan's case, epistemic credulity is precisely what makes him not at all like, say, Socrates, the first live action podcaster. Socrates built his philosophical wisdom on self-examination and the acceptance of one's own ignorance, which meant that when he had guests, i.e. Athenian leaders, on his podcast, i.e. a street corner, he aimed to push them through a series of questions to evaluate the truth of their arguments. Unlike Socrates, Rogan seems mostly comfortable with letting everyone share their opinions opinions with some exceptions rather than pushing bingo and himself towards a deeper level of self-examination it's all so entertainment do you enjoy the surfs but prefer not to have to use your eyeballs many are saying this well we've got the solution for you it's the surf times in podcast form available on most major podcasting networks now if you enjoy it please consider leaving a good review and feedback because it really helps the show out apparently and it's free just like the podcast to our god Xander Corvus and Peyton L. Just, we are prepared to conduct many a human sacrifices in your honor. To our monarch, Tom Spiker, we are but your humble yet incompetent gestures, trying in vain to bring some levity into your life. To our lord, Trevor R., we give you thanks for this meager plot of land for us to toil away our pathetic existence. To our brave knights, Carl Wauer, Tony, DM Rivera, Resident Scarecrow, Sir Nickus, Mayred, Cheryl Alvarez, Ruben Kelly, Brandon, Words Greenwood, Nate, Hagbird Celine, Matthew Scarborough, Stellar Vision, Ariane McCarthy, Daniel Sutton, Coulter Smith, Jenna Tal, Quiet185, Anna Loves Riley, Omni, Riley and Anna, Poodlehawk, The Tim Caucus, Multimondi, Trevor Janis, Lemmy101, Anthropophojack, Saren42, Catherine, Ramon Acosta, Incosin, Agent NDN, Violent Orchard, Political Puppy, Andreas Chiringuito, Zach Christensen, Todd Buckingham, and Todd Lajeunesse. We salute our mighty heroes off to conquest some bread in some far off land.